Okay, we are live. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On today's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Robert W. Sullivan, last name S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. And I've seen him around, and he's interested in things that I'm interested in as well, kind of like decoding films. And he's written three books. I bought all three books. I think it's a great deal on Amazon. You can get all three of his books on cinema symbolism for $20. And they're very well researched. There's a lot of interesting things that I would never have thought of or looking into. And I've done some of these decodes. I've done work with Sean McCann and the guys from PSYOP Cinema and done some. But there's some in here that I really haven't covered. But the full title is of these three books, Trilogy. Cinema Symbolism, A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. And like I said, it's one, two, part one, two, and three. And you, if you're watching on here, I have all three covers on StreamYard. But uh, he has a very lengthy bio. He has a very different interests, but he can talk more about that. So Robert Sullivan, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Bill, for having me on William Ramsey Investigate. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, just briefly, my name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. I'm the author of uh, five books, uh, three on the movie Symbolism, uh, the occult, you know, the occult in movies, um, which you mentioned. I'm also author of the book, The Royal Arch of Enoch. That's probably the one I'm most no known for. That's a book on esoteric Freemasonry. I am a Freemason. Um, I, I was made a Freemason uh, here in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, 25 years ago in the Blue Lodge. And then uh, in, in the Scottish Rite, I became a 32nd in 1999. And I also have a work of fiction out called A Pact with the Devil. Again, just work of fiction. But um, yeah, the, 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 these are subjects, mysticism, you know, call whatever you will, magic, sorcery, psyop uh, in cinema. This is something that's, you know, very, very interesting uh, to me. I'm actually working on a couple books um, as we speak. I'm doing a Cinema Symbolism 4 book, which is really coming along well. I'm going to do a book uh, solely on The Wizard of Oz. Uh, that, that is a very, a very, very vast uh, topic. So I'm going to do that. And I'm working a couple uh, re-editions of some of my earlier works. Uh, there's some things in there I want to clean up. But again, um, you know, uh, I'm also a lawyer. Uh, I'm here in Baltimore, Maryland. I practice law. Um, and I, I've, uh, I studied at Gettysburg College. I studied abroad at Oxford University. I went to law school at Widener University School of Law. And again, just as uh, from a very early age, uh, mysticism, sorcery, secret societies, the occult, uh, these were always topics that were near and dear to me. Um, UFOs, cryptozoology, and, uh, you know, it's... Uh, you know, I, I've uh, written some books on them. And uh, again, it's uh, my pleasure to be here with you uh, when William Ramsey investigates. Excellent. And uh, yeah, I was listening to you one on one. I, we're talking the pre show. I was on his show. I think I might him on my show, too. But uh, that was a really fascinating conversation. But maybe The Wizard of Oz is a good start. I've never really looked in detail. Very influential book. I think you said on one on one there were 14 books, right? Seven and seven. Like, and it's yeah. super esoteric. Yeah, well, there's 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 a couple. Um, the, the the Wizard of Oz is a very vast subject. I mean, you have you have just on its surface, and this was something I talked about in, in one of my earlier books. Is I mean, you have just the basic um, symbolism or the the esoteric themes where you have um, the political allegory, where this is a retelling of the uh, 19, late nineteenth century um, political socio economic climate in the United States, where Dorothy Gale is sort of the common farm girl. Uh, the, the scarecrow is the American farmer. The tin man is the American laborer. The yellow brick road has to do with the gold standard. In, in the novel, the slippers are silver. That had to do with something known as the free silver movement. The Wizard of Oz is President McKinley. Um, more, more people are aware of this uh, than not. But then you have uh, this, this sort of Kabbalistic Gnostic um, uh, theme in it where clearly, clearly, I mean, this this really isn't surprising with Baum, um, who is a member of Blavatsky's Theosophy, where you have this whole idea of uh, initiation, what you want to call it, into the mysteries, where the whole purpose of this was to know thyself. And this is exactly what happens with Dorothy Gale. She goes on this magical quest uh, to discover who she is, which she eventually does. I mean, her epiphany is there's no place like home. Um, and, and you have you have this, you know, it, it's a very uh, what I would call Valentinian Gnostic uh, theme in it. You can also see elements of Kabbalah. Kabbalah parallels this. Uh, one of the Sephiroth is the negative female, and that's clearly meant to be the Wicked Witch. So we have this this very deep Gnostic Kabbalistic uh, theme in the Wizard of Oz. 
But then um, we have we have this uh, Alistair Crowley numerology going on with this thing that is just absolutely astounding. Uh, that has to do with it, it has a very very uh, complex backstory. I'll I'll try to sum it up. I mean, I I, I could do a whole show on this one. It's oh, sure, I mean, right. I mean the, the the backstory is incredibly lengthy, but um, it it seems to be that if if you when you look at Crowley's Gematri and his Kubala that he develops for the Aeon of Horus. Uh, one of the key numbers is this number of this new sun god, uh, which is Baphomet. This is the goat of Mendes, and his number is 77. Um, and, and he actually identifies this thing as Oz, O-Z. Um, this is in book 777. And um, a lot of what Crowley And Libra 77, Libra 77 as well, which yeah, is and, called and, Oz. Yeah. Right. The, the number 77 is, is Oz, as in the Wizard of. And uh, you'll you'll find this number and a couple and a lot of other Crowley's numbers popping up on these tragedies, and and it's really quite astounding how they permeate them. Um, and and the other thing that's very disturbing is you always find whether it be you know nine eleven or the Kennedy assassination or this that and the other these little Wizard of Oz illusions in there, which leads me to believe that it was this was some sort of death hex pop, probably propagated by the Native Americans, placed on L. Frank Baum, but didn't really do anything to him and seems to have latched on to the Wizard of Oz, his novels, and really became active, kinetic with the making of this movie. And, and subsequently, since starting past 1939, this thing is re really active. And it seems to be doing two things. It seems to be killing a lot of people and designating this new age of horse, which is the Aquarian age. It's the same thing. Um, so, so that's really um, the topic that I'm really putting in my new books um, is, is this whole Wizard of Oz. I, I call it the Rainbow Oz Death Hex. I, I can't think of anything to call this. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. But yeah, the the Wizard of Oz. I mean, certainly, you know, even even with you get in, even if you you know put that aside and you get into just the cabalistic Gnostic themes, uh, very very deep movie, very deep deep story, no question. Coming out of the Wizard of Oz, by the way. Um, I mean, excuse me, um, heavily influenced by Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Excuse me. Oh, interesting. So Wizard of Oz is influenced by Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, and then. The Wizard of Oz, it's it goes through permeates so many movies, right, all the way up to Eyes Wide Shut, and so many statements underneath uh, under the rainbow, and you oh, know the sure. wizard behind the curtain. So many kind of idioms and things like that reference this, and then they say that it's used in mind control. Did you ever have see any kind of like like a cult programming or mind control connections to the Wizard of Oz? Because that's what I thought. Yeah, I've I've heard that story. I, I haven't been able to fully pin that down, but my goodness, you're right. I mean, it has been influential in so many uh, movies, um, whether it be um, Eyes Wide Shut. And I should point out, Eyes Wide Shut is open opens on seventy seven. Um, Eyes Wide Shut opened on July sixteenth, July seven month sixteen. One plus six is seven. So you have your seventy seven again there. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Eyes Wide Shut, Midsommar. Uh, is essentially a remake of The Wizard of Oz, wow. um, the yeah. Ari Aster movie where the girl goes to the you know strange land to have a Gnostic epiphany, to have a, a revelation, awakening. So yeah, I mean, a heavily, high, highly influential movie. I mean, I mean, you, you could argue, I think, quite successfully that, I mean, in the top three or four movies ever made, I mean, The Wizard of Oz will inevitably uh, be on everyone's list, probably somewhere in, in, in that range. I mean, I guess Gone with the Wind, um, you know, you know, or right, The Wizard of Oz. Right. You know, I don't I don't know if this generation's it may be the Matrix is this generation's Wizard of Oz, but when I was growing up, everybody watched the Wizard of Oz. It was like something you watch like the Ten Commandments on TV. Oh, absolutely. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. I remember watching it as a kid. I mean, yeah, when it yeah. came on television, you kind of like never missed it. I mean, it was like yeah, a, that's yeah right. it was like yeah. a major event. Yeah. And uh yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I totally agree. And and uh I, I I've I'm familiar with the the mind control aspects. I'm not quite sure I can quite pin that down yet, but um, the numbers with this thing are, are amazing. And again, even if you put that aside, you still have this very deep, you know, Gnostic Kabbalistic theme. And again, it really shouldn't surprise many people because the guy who wrote it was a member of Bolovatsky's Theosophy That's Movement, where this is, you know, you know, par for the course, as it were. But wasn't Baum, didn't he become a millionaire off of these books? Like it really brought him fame and fortune, right? Well, it did bring him fame and fortune, and uh, he did make money off of it, but he did wind up filing a bankruptcy at some point in time, okay. I, I believe, before he died. Um, there, there's a unique story with The Wizard of Oz. I'm not sure if you know it. It's more of a synchronicity um, than anything. 
um, it, it was when 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 it was made by MGM, and if you you know you read the book on it, I mean MGM made everything, but when it came time to uh, costume uh, Professor Marvel, who is Frank Morgan, of course he's the guy who plays five characters in the story. He plays the wizard also. He plays the guy at the door uh, when when they get to the Emerald City, but he also plays Professor Marvel in the in the black and white scene uh, at the beginning. When when they were casting him, for some reason they came up a sh short of a of, of a waistcoat or a jacket. Uh, like a waist jacket, um, a trench coat, as it were. So they ran down, uh, they, they, they sent a couple, you know, people down to the local thrift shop to buy a couple jackets and they brought him back and he picked one out that he liked that fit him and he was wearing it. And uh, they, it's filmed in the movie. You can see him wearing it. And uh, after, after the scene was shot, he was just sitting around. He was just doing nothing. And he turned out the pocket in it. And there was a name inscribed in the pocket on the name tag. It was L Frank Baum. Um, and it turns out that the jacket actually belonged to L Frank Baum. And um, one of his jackets actually made it into the movie just by pure happenstance. Wow. That's yeah. And they, they, they actually took the jacket. Uh, people at MGM took the jacket, found Baum's uh, relatives or his wife in Chicago, and they did verify that it was one of his jackets that um, he, he vacationed often in California. Um, and, and somewhere along the line, you know, he turned it in or it was sold off and it wound up in this thrift shop near the MGM studio. And lo and behold, L. Frank Baum's jacket is worn by Professor Marvel and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> wow, it's incredible. One of the incredible things is the, the African-American version of the Wizard of Oz. The Wiz ends up at, at the World Trade Center. You should check it out. You will oh, be yeah. like, as, have you seen that? Yeah, the the, the, okay. the land of the land of Oz is the twin towers of all things. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, that, no, it's that, incredible. I mean, that's you want to talk about bad luck. Um, yeah. I mean, there 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 you have it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the the Wiz movie, the land of Oz, is the World Trade Center. Not not good to say the least. Yeah, no, but it's just a weird synchronicity. Like, that's it, and that was like the center of the two thousand one event. It's inc incredible with seventy sevens too, right? So. You oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. The the flight the 77. yeah, I mean, you, where you have yeah, I mean, you have flight seventy seven. Um, flight seventy seven departed from Dulles Airport, which is on the seventy seventh parallel. Hit the Pentagon, seventy seventh parallel. You well, you know all this. I'm preaching. To uh, the yeah, floor. right. And the the Pentagon was uh, the the date that they started it was September eleventh, nineteen forty one. Yeah, and That's it's seventy seven feet, and it's seventy seven feet tall. Right, and, I mean, it's incredible. And then, and then, and then, at at if if you read Crawley, he says in in seven seven seven, he said the satanic forces. He says, you know that I'm behind this. He said the satanic forces of the Kabbalah marshal are seven seven seven, and on nine eleven, it was um, on at, at Lower Manhattan, it was three hundred forty three firemen died battling the places in the World Trade Center. Three hundred forty three is seven cubed. That's seven seven seven, and up until that date, up until in 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 New York City, up until nine eleven, till nine ten two thousand one, the amount of firefighters that died on active duty in New York City is seven hundred seventy seven. So go figure. Wow, wow, that's just super eerie numerology stuff like that on that date. I mean, it's really something else. But all the connections and stuff like that. Yeah, what seven 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 for people don't know was Crowley's book of cons uh, correspondences. And it was right. So that's all the kind of same gods from Greece and Rome and all how they're really the same concepts. They're just well, he, he, what he what 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 he does in seven 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 is he creates a, a system of Kubala and Gematria with numbers, um, and he he reassigns numbers, um, and 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 in it he he assigns different numbers to different things. So. For example, and they, this is for the new age. This is for the new age of, of Horus. So, for example, one of the things he says in there is, you know, in Islam and in the Bible, one of the high holy numbers is seven. Well, he reverses this. In in seven seven seven, the number seven is thoroughly evil. Um, and then he gets into he gets into numbers that are very deadly. Um, and he, he mentions these in some other books. These numbers also turn up on these events. Um, so this is again, and, and they they relink they they relate to the Wizard of Oz. That's what makes this thing um so macabre and so so morbid um to, to examine. And again, this is this is the subject of these two new books I'm working on. It's Cinema Symbolism 4 which should be out next year. And then I'm doing one called Cinema Symbolism Oz, which is just going to be strictly- Oh, wow. Cool stuff. Well, I got a tip for you. Look at Oliver Stone's Trade Center. He knows the numerology. He puts it in 
the whole thing. It's worth, oh, I'll uh, check it out. I'll definitely yeah, check, check it out. out. You'll see the fireman has the night. I mean, it's so right, right before the building comes down, you'll see a 77 and a 93 and 11 flash on the screen through different kind of very clever. Like you are talking about how some of these guys really are artists and craftsmen. I was on your earlier discussions and you can see that with stone and he puts it into, he puts the numerology of 77 right at the beginning of natural born killers too. So he has 77 sunset Boulevard. Like it's incredible. Like for you, for somebody who knows the 77, check out stone, some of his work, but yeah, right before the trade towers go down and trade center, 11, 77, and 93 are there, and they're not there by accident. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that. I got to go back and rewatch Natural Born Killers. Um, that was a movie that was released, I believe, in 19... I have to go look at the date, but the date it was released is August 26th. Um, that syncs with The Wizard of Oz, because The Wizard of Oz was, like, was released on August 25th. Um, so it's one day later, like 40 years later or something. But I, I have to go look that up again. 1994. And yeah. tons of smiley faces in there, too, by the way. Like, I'll have to go... Like I'll have to go look at – I haven't watched Natural Bone Killers in a while, so I'll definitely check that out, and I'll definitely check out the World Trade Center movie. I've seen pieces of that. This is the one with Nick Cage, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I'll check it out. I've seen pieces yeah. of it, but I'll sit down and watch it again. You only, I mean, you can watch the whole thing, but just look for the the indicators for five, just five, sec, five minutes okay. of it. It's like the numerology will just be like – you'll be stunned. Okay. It's all there. And the numerology and Smiley Face Killers. He knows all that stuff. He knows the smile – I mean, the Natural Bone Killers, excuse me. Uh, he knows a lot. Stone is Yale Secret Society. I don't think he's Skull and Bones, but he's in like Cross and Key or something like that. So he's familiar with the sea secret knowledge. There's no doubt about it. And then more too, like you bring up more Alan Moore stuff too. There's a lot. He's an esotericist or an occultist for without question, right? Oh yeah, I mean, if you if you look if you look at his if his movies, I mean, yeah, they're they're replete. I mean, you have you have the um, you know the the, the movies. Then you have the, the 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 comics. He he sometimes isn't fan of, of of the movies, but yeah, I mean, and by and large, I mean, yeah, he he's he's like a neo pagan, a, an occultist. Um, and yeah, I mean, you look at stuff like uh, like V for Vendetta. There there's a, a, a lot of interesting stuff going on in there. The From Hell movie. Um, is interesting. Some some of the stuff with the Jack the Ripper stuff, it's always it's always interesting to me that um, he mentions it in the comics, and they always leave it out. I mean, I'm a Freemason, of course. I know the whole story with Ripper being a, a Freemason. I, I'm not sold on it, but there isn't there is a unique nexus um, to to the Ripper murders and Nicholas Hoare, who was a, a a Freemason and an architect who constructed these very bizarre very neoplatonic dark churches around london and uh the ripper seems to at least the one in Whitechapel, seems to have killed around this church um and that's interesting it's always left out that's always left out of the um ripper you know the ripper masonic conspiracy they always get into the penalties and the prostitutes were killed you know you know in you know in the signs of the masons and stuff like that um and it was it was you know the the the, the doctor william gall who's covering up for the syphilis of, of the archduke or whatever it was um, I mean, I think I think there's very little evidence that William Gall was ever a Freemason, but they always leave out the Nicholas Hawksmore connection. Um, he mentions it in the novel, but I mean, in the comic, but it, it's not in the movie. But Who's yeah, Nicholas I, Hawksmore? I don't know who that is. Oh, he, he's a he's a very famous English architect. Um, very, very, very famous. He's probably second only to like Christopher Wren. He was a Freemason and he he constructed um, a series of churches around England that are very, very bizarre. Um, some people describe them as wholly satanic. Um, I've examined them. I, I think I would call them more Neoplatonic. They're very Egyptian. Uh, they're very, they use pyramids, obelisks. Um, there's, there's the one, I think, uh, I can't remember where it is. Guy, you, I used to know, I used to be really into this. That has a pyramid outside. There's a lot of buildings. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That sits, it sits on a ley line. There's one of his churches. I can't remember which one that's on a, on a ley line that was where John D practiced magic or something. Um, and, and the one thing that's, the one thing that's unique with Hawksmoor was he did All Souls College at Oxford, which is the only college at Oxford without students. It's basically it's like a fellowship. And when I was over there, I mean, I even heard this when I was there, that this was like the Illuminati headquarters was All Souls College at Oxford. I mean, that, that's a rumor that persists to this day. I mean, it's, it's this very, you know, like isolated, school, you know, college. No one goes near it, has these manicured lawns, has no students, and it's always empty. And I've always heard 
you know, even this even went back to the early 90s, that this was some sort of like headquarters of the Illuminati or the globalists wow. or something like that. Wow. It was All Souls College at Oxford. Wouldn't be surprised. It has all the heraldry on it. You can see a picture of it right here. It's got the heraldry like you see in the ritual scene of Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, that, that's oh, one of Hawksmoor's. He, yeah. he did All Souls. And yeah, he's, he did. i never heard that name before. Wow. There he is right there. Yep. Close Hawksmoor. Yeah, Wren did St. Paul's Cathedral, right? Correct. And I think he did something else, like a some kind of monument for the Great Fire of 1666 or something like that, if I remember right. But yeah, so more from hell. He's done V for Vendetta, The Watchmen. I mean, so many of the, I mean, incredible, like uh, Watchmen itself has, has a lot of kind of a cult ref cult references or cult kind of doctrines right oh yeah i mean i mean well you have the whole character the villain of moloch um you know of course that conjures bohemian grove i mean there's clearly allusions in there to freemasonry with the with the whole egyptian thing i think the one piece of mail is from uh the guy ozymandias's egyptian corporation and then right behind that is another piece of mail from the jesuits um and and that's uh that has to do with high degree freemasonry the jesuits were the crafters of the high degrees of freemasonry uh going back to the 1740s 1750s um so yeah i mean i mean yeah his, his stuff is whenever you look at an alan moore film it's like it's like lynch or kubrick it's always heavy lifting i mean you always have to pay attention to it very 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 carefully there's usually a lot going on and has to be viewed more than one time yeah, right. That's so true. Like eyes wide shut, you notice something new every day. I mean, it's it's really incredible. And yeah, it was interesting. Like I heard your other talk. Like you think, or your position is Kubrick, kind of telegraphed his future works in Lolita and other stuff, which make would kind of make sense because in eyes wide shut, it's kind of like a retrospective of all of his earlier photography. It's an homage to himself and his friends almost. There's when you watch there. Lolita, you will definitely see things play out in Lolita that he that, that that turn up in his later movies. I mean, even from the very beginning, where he where where the the James Mason character Humbert is approaching the house, and, and you will clearly see that is The Shining. I mean, that's the opening of The Shining. You'll see the the furniture. I mean, that's clearly a draw to two thousand and one in Clockwork Orange, covered covered with the sheets. Um, Peter Sellers mentioned Spartacus. Um, that was his prior movie. Uh, that he made right before Lolita. So yeah, when you watch Lolita, that's kind of like a roadmap for him. Um, the interesting thing with um, with with Kubrick is, uh, again, Eyes Wide Shut, you have the Wizard of Oz uh, homage. Um, and I, I, like I said, I think this is some sort of killing curse. Uh, one of the kill numbers for this is 42. That's a number that he uses all over the place in The Shining. Um, I, I think he was using it as a reference to the Antichrist. There's some biblical things going on in that movie, not realizing that Crowley doomed the number. Um, and Eyes Wide Shut opens on July, um, what was it, um, 16th. This is one of the active, more active dates of this thing. July 16th, 1999, not only saw Eyes Wide Shut open, Kubrick had just died a few months earlier. Um, July, July 16th, 1999 was also when John F. Kennedy Jr. died uh, in the plane crash in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, the Kennedy curse is, is this thing, you know, taking them out left and right. Um, this is this Rainbow Oz death hex destroying them. Um, the, the, also on July 16th or, or in 1945 was the first nuclear bomb test, uh, which yeah. was, uh, just, just, uh, dramatized in Oppenheimer, uh, which I just watched, which when you watch it, you know, the first thing that stands out is, oh, the movie's in color and black and white, you know, oh, gee whiz, what other movie do I know that's filmed like that? The Wizard of Oz. Um, so that, right. that was, that was very interesting to me. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible. Uh, I mean, so, and you also, when you you checked, like you, one of the occult things is James Bond's, right, connection oh. to the occult, right? Can you talk about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, 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 the world of Ian Fleming, the, uh, you call it the occult world of Ian Fleming. Um, absolutely. Uh, during, during the war, the person who, uh, well, I mean, who he was a spy for the British government was, of course, your friend and mine, Master Theory on 666. Um, and his handler at, at, in British intelligence was none other than Ian Fleming. Um, and when, when you look at the Fleming work, um, the novels, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's all sorts of occult uh, themes going on. I mean, right down to the James Bond 007. This is, of course, John D's 007 sigil, the, the court astrologer for Queen Elizabeth I, uh, the, the creator with Edward Kelly of Enochian magic, Enochian sorcery. This is angelic magic to try to talk to these angels in these celestial hierarchies. 
Um, and when, when he went on a spy mission to the Holy Roman Empire uh, on behalf of the queen, he, he used the, the sigil 007. Um, it was meant to be eyeglasses, two circles and a line over it, then a line down the side. And it looks like 007. And this was the inspiration for making Bond uh, 007. Um, and, and, you know, you, when, when you watch the Bond movie, they all kind of follow the same uh, theme that they have this sort of, um, you know, Illuminati globalist arch villain uh, trying to take over the world. And then you have Bond. It's very alchemical because you have this idea of Bond being the divine masculine. And then you have the Bond girl who is the sacred feminine. This is this is al this is al alchemy 101. This is the, you know, known as coincidentia oppositorum, the union of opposites, the marriage of the sun and moon, the, the alchemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, where Bond then will unite with the Bond girl, and then he goes on to defeat this, you know, demiurgic, like, you know, supervillain. Um, I mean, that's the same play in in in, in all the uh, in all the novels that were made into the have, movies. Uh, have you, you have, read the novels? Have you? I've heard they're replete with all kinds of references and secret references. I mean, the first novel, uh, Casino Royale, the Le Chiffre, is Crowley. It's Crowley, right? right. Yeah, that's you, you have you have is is Le Chiffre is Crowley. Um, and 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 that was if if you watch the movie and it's in the it's in the novel is he uses the inhaler, um, and that was a reference to Cr Crowley developed asthma later in his life because of all his drug use and, and smoking you know hashish and God knows what, and he he had asthma later and he he incorporates that um, into Le Chiffre. and then the character of Blofeld, uh, this is the guy who runs Spectre, um, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. The, the Blofeld character is is an imitation of Crowley, but it's 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 the it's the Blofeld in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, because if you if you're familiar with the the novel and it's made into the movie, this is the this is the odd movie out. This is the one with George Lazenby that no one ever sees because it doesn't have Connery and it doesn't have Roger Moore. In the one with George Lazenby, this is the one where Telly Savalas plays Blofeld. This is the movie where Blofeld is trying to he, he's trying to be called, he's trying he's holding himself out as this guy named uh, Balthazar de Blo de Blochamp. This this like French royalty, and he's trying to get this this heraldry to, to be to be recognized as, as this as this counter or viscount or whatever it is of of the blow shop, and this was Crowley. C Crowley routinely throughout his life held himself out as Scottish royalty. It was a hoax. I mean, he wasn't right. no more Scottish royalty than I am. He called himself Lord Boleskin, held himself out as Scottish nobility. So this idea. In, he in, had all in, these different personas. He had yeah, but it was all right. BS. I mean, yeah. probably wasn't yeah. Scottish royalty, but when he went to Egypt with his wife, he always was holding himself as Lord Boleskin. And yeah. and this this is reflected by by Fleming in the Blofeld in uh in in for on Her Majesty's, where Blofeld is trying to hold himself out as French nobility when he really isn't. Um so the Crowley, that Crowley aspect uh, uh of him trying to pass himself off as fake you know as royalty basically that turns up in on her majesty's secret service so yeah i mean you see crowley as le Schiff and uh the the cipher and as uh blofeld and uh for your and for your eyes only on her majesty's secret service right. you could just do there's a whole there's a whole book for just crowley and cinema because so many oh. people are based on it it's everywhere um i heard there's even like a crowley figure in one of the harry potter films is that right isn't there like one i thought the one of the guys who was overseeing or officiating at the beginning of one of the harry potter films is tall and bald like crowley but yeah I'd, 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 have, I'd have to go back and look at that i mean i know you can see crowley in um i'm trying to think there's i mean there's so many of them there's a um of the guy um if there's a movie called night of the demon um where the guy in that is obviously a crowley analog um, the guy in, in Dunwich Horror, this is the Dean Stockton character. I forget his name. That's, that's clearly meant to be Crowley. Oh um, yeah. Devil I mean, Rides Out. Devil yeah. Rides the, out. Oh, oh, that's the biggie. Yeah. That's the one that's yeah. escaping me. Uh, Mokata obviously is, Mokata, right. uh, Alistair Crowley. Oh, the two mother, um, the guy in Rosemary's Baby. Um, and he has the same right. name. They, they, that's right. that the, the name of the black magician in Rosemary's Baby is, a, is an homage to Devil Rides Out because wow. in Devil Rides Out, it's Mokata. This is the Dennis Wheatley novel. This Wheatley, right. Wheatley hung around with uh, Fleming, but then the and guy- Crowley, they all were together. Oh, and yeah. even like Knight, who was the head of the Intel, knew Crowley. There's this, I have a signed copy of Crowley's Magic and Theory and Practice signed to Dennis Wheatley in my book, Children of the Beast. So like oh, they, yeah, so yeah, yeah. 
the 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 guy in Rosemary's Baby is Stephen Mercada, and it's it's phonetically almost the same. It's Mercada and Mocada, and then the other one, um, right? You you just named yeah, and there's another one. Oh, the um the one in the Universal picture, the one with Boris Karloff and Lugosi, Halimar Perlzig in The Black Cat. That's also Crowley. Um, you know, and and that's a very dark movie. Uh, the Black Cat with Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff for whatever that is, the early 30s, incredibly dark film. Wow. I have to check that out. I haven't heard of that. The Magician, too, comes to mind by Somerset Mom. He wrote the book and the new Crowley, and then the film was made, I think, 19, very early black and white, 1919, something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So there's a lot there. I mean, the uh, there's just a lot to talk about. You also, you've looked into Harry Potter. You've done some Freemasonry. Like, what's your take on uh, Jacob's Ladder? Do you feel like that is? What do you think they're trying to impart? Well, you you definitely have. I guess I guess that's one of the granddaddy of the MK Ultra movies. Um, you know, I mean, I mean that that explicitly you know hints at MK Ultra. Couple things with Jacob's Ladder is um, one is I mean, and this is probably maybe not an occult aspect of it, but clearly this is the movie that influences M Night Shyamalan's uh, The Sixth Sense. Um, if, if you if if you've if you've never seen Jacob's Ladder and you watch The Sixth Sense, you'll think Sixth Sense is this you know kick ass movie. But if you watch Jacob's Ladder, which I think came out in 1990, so much of 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 Sixth Sense comes out of Jacob's Ladder. This is a this is a movie, Jacob's Ladder, that is a very fine line, um, where it you can call this a Gnostic film or you call it an alchemical film. Um, certainly, the medieval, you know, the Renaissance alchemists borrowed a lot of their thought from from the Christian Gnostics, you know, which is a heresy. Um, so, so they have a lot of overlap. They have a lot of overlapping themes. You can look at it as alchemical, where he's transitioning into a ghost and he's learning out his fate, or you could even call that an agnostic epiphany. But again, with 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 um, with Jacob's Ladder, that's one of these like coming to know thyself movie where the guy starts out as something else and then winds up something at the end. Where he has to go on this sort of mystical quest to learn out who learn his identity. Um, but what I like about Jacob's Ladder is clearly you have the um, MK Ultra aspect in it, and again, I, I like the idea of you know where. You know, it's it's the false reality. It's the whole thing with the false reality that you'll find in the Matrix. This comes out of a Gnostic uh, heretic named, known as Valentinus. Um, the whole idea of the false reality. Um, right. You know, you'll find this it's like in, the Matrix, right? Yeah, yeah right. You'll find, I mean, yeah. It, it, I mean, if you if you ask me to to name the top three Valentinian movies ever made, I mean, if they all come out basically within three years of each other. It's the Matrix. It's the Truman Show. And it's uh, Dark City. I mean, that is, those three movies are the Valentinian strain of Gnosticism where the protagonist is in a false reality and there's some sort of hidden puppet master or puppet masters pulling the strings that he has to find out about. That's, that's Valentinian Gnosticism. Um, I mean, it goes back 2,000 years. Um, so it's nothing new. But um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 and you have that in Jacob's Ladder where he's in this reality that's not real. Um, you know, but right. but in that case, it's he's a ghost. I mean, you kind of think of like, you know, a few years later in 2001, you have the Others movie uh, with Nicole Kidman. Kind of, it's kind of like that, only in reverse. Um, you know, the Sixth Sense backwards almost. So, no, I like Jacob's Ladder. It's a very good movie. I'm a fan of Adrian Lyne. Um, he 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 always tinkers around with al alchemical themes and, and, and symbolism and color schemes. Um, I mean, even, even movies that you wouldn't think so. I mean, the movie with uh, Glenn Close and Michael Douglas, um, um, uh, Fatal Attraction, that, that, has, uh, that has some very unique costuming in it regarding colors, which is very pertinent to the Glenn Close character. Um, Nine and a half weeks, uh, same thing. The, the, the colors in that um, are very, very alchemical. Uh, the transition of the self, uh, as it were. Um, so so right. I, I, do, I do enjoy his work. So you mentioned that like these are you go from negro to red right to gold right well the the, the 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 traditional color schemes for alchemy is the negredo the citronatus or the rubido or the albedo is second then the citronatus which is yellowing and and then the finality is the rubido the red red can mean different things at different times depending on the context um so like for exa example if it's an alchemical movie red usually will turn up when when there's a transitioning occurring um black swan does this fantastically um 
in other things, red can mean death. Uh, the Egyptians associated the color red with death and with this with this god known as Typhon or Set, which is the prototype of this devil. Uh, if you watch the second Omen movie, every time someone's about to die, unless the Antichrist is present, they're shrouded in red. Um, and this, is, of course, is foreshadowing their death. This not only comes out of the Egyptian mysteries, this comes from a movie uh, that came out in 1973 called Don't Look Now, where red is used to right. be, um, be, to, to prophesy death and destruction. And then M. Night Shalaman picks up on this for The Sixth Sense, where he uses red for, for exactly the same thing. Don't so, Look Now is one of the scariest movies. It's so unnerving and eerie. It's really... I love stuff. that movie. Yeah, it's like the psychology is incredible in that film. I mean, there's not like a lot of explosions or nifty editing but it's really it's well, really, glad, people haven't seen it i'm so i'm so glad you brought this movie up because I'll, I'll just i'll go over this quickly um the one thing that 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 is 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 with um eyes wide shut is this is sort of what i would call the godfather of the repetition movies um this movie just repeats all over the place i mean people saying things back to each other the color schemes the themes the tropes i mean this thing just repeats 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 i think kubrick saw this movie because when you watch the shining he uses the same tricks that are in don't look now if you watch The Shining's opening credits, they're that periwinkle blue, which I think is an homage to Psycho, but they're the exact same color as the credits and don't look now. So I think Kubrick, by using wow. that periwinkle blue color scheme for the opening credits, was paying homage to two movies, Psycho, because Kubrick was obsessed with toilets. Um, and 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 Psycho was the first movie to, picture, to depict a flushing toilet. If you ever watch a Kubrick movie, all the key scenes take place in bathrooms. I mean, every one of them. Um, so when you're watching Kubrick, I mean, it's the it's the Kubrick toilet. I mean, it's w a well-known trope. And I think that Kubrick must have seen Don't Look Now because he he uses those same repetitive tricks and techniques in Don't Look Now and trans literally transfers them to The Shining. It's quite astounding. Wow, that's amazing. So The Shining, and then the, he uses the breakfast scene in The Shining in Eyes Wide Shut, right? And during oh, that wow. breakfast... During that breakfast scene, there's a 77. When is it, John? Seven. 77? Like, they say 77 to each other. It's really something else. So there's, like, it's the craft. It's, like, the visual and the audio and the uh, narrative. It's all wrapped together right in that, those scenes. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, they, 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 you know, they will definitely, um, you know, you know, he, he will definitely, you know, pay homage to himself and reference other movies. Um, I, I'm convinced that he... The I, if you like I said he's obsessed with bathrooms. I mean all, all his key scenes happen in bathrooms. I'm convinced that comes from Hitchcock because Hitchcock Psycho is the first movie, which is a very influential movie and very symbolic also um, that pictured pic, that depicted a flushing toilet. Um, and I think Kubrick took that and ran with it. It must be that bathrooms are like a they're like a safe space or something. There must be something, or people are vulnerable because they're not clothed, right? Right. Something I mean, it's it's a it's a it's basically a space where you do your private business, and he exposes. He you know he exposes. I mean, you know, you think of The Shining where Jack is right. talking to the ghost or the the hatchet well, scene. He's going after his wife, right? Mrs. Yeah, he's going after his bathroom, wife. Right? You know, what James Mason is is in the tub when he finds out the wife is dead. I mean, Hartman at the Full Metal Jacket blows his brains. He gets shot in the bathroom, right. in the head at the end of it. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, the the overdose and eyes wide shut is in the toilet at the very beginning of it. So yeah, I mean, I mean, the 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 bathroom for Kubrick is a repetitive trope that he uses in all his films. Um, and I, I think that goes back to Psycho. Um, but yeah, I'm a huge fan of Kubrick. I, I love his work. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's all like legit. And the references are really something else. Um, is there anything else you'd like to cover? We're at 40 minutes. I mean, your books go in detail. You cover Star Wars, The Matrix, Lord of the Rings. Uh, some of these older, you go through some of these other horror films too, like Suspiria. But a lot of people don't know, right? They don't know how good Suspiria is, right? Isn't that, what was the guy's name? It was uh, Dario Argento. Argento, yeah. That's they right. made they remade it a few years ago and I very much like the remake. Um, usually I'm not a fan of these horror remakes, but I thought that one came out pretty well. Um, yeah, the one thing the one thing that I, I when I analyzed uh, Suspiria, um, I, I missed this the first time I analyzed it. I, I saw it again later was, um, and then this is something very subtle uh, that you, it's, it's very inexplicit, but it's in there is uh, the, the dance academy in, um, there's, a very, there's a very latent Rosicrucian uh, theme to this, to this movie that um, the, the dance academy that the Susie goes to is in Heidelberg. This is the, this is the original Suspiria from the 70s. And um, 
if you look at the dance academy, it, 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 there's a plaque on the wall outside of it. I believe it's a door. It's Erasmus. I forget. And he was like a free thinker, a proto enlightenment character. He's linked to the Rosicrucians. And when she finally um, breaks into the witch's coven at the end and she's going down the corridor, the, the implication is um, and, and the Heidelberg was the big hangout of the Rosicrucians. At least that that was the theory was the Bohemian, you know, the, the winter king and queen of 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 of. Uh, you know, that was their castle was in, in Heidelberg. That was the big Rosicrucian stronghold. When Susie at the end of it is going through the corridors, keep an eye out like on the wall, the, the stuff on the wall. It's all these Rosicrucian symbols, words, uh, you know, from the Rosicrucian manifestos and stuff. So I think the implication is that the witch's coven or whatever drove out the Rosicrucians at, at some point in time. Um, I mean, even there's a link in, in there was a Rosicrucian scare in Paris where uh, some broadside surface that the Rosicrucians were actually in league with the devil, um, which of course would sink probably more with the movie. Um, so I thought that was very late. I mean, you won't pick up on it at all. I, I just discovered this very recently. Um, I didn't even put it in the books. I, like I said, I just recently discovered it, but um, yeah, there's, there's some very interesting Rosicrucian uh, themes going on in, in uh, Daria Argenta's uh, Suspiria. Whether it's the directors or they're very clever set designers or, design people like they put things in incredible places like the tesseract and rosemary's baby is so subtle you would never see it but well, what, what was it in rosemary's baby test do you know what a tesseract is it's a square within the square it's called yeah. a tesseract but she's in there when she's reading she lies down on the bed or on the couch and there's a tesseract pillow and she puts her head in it it's symbolically so powerful because she is under their spell the right. entire time Guy's the one who brings her into the uh, what is it? not the Overlook? It's the Dakota, right? So he, she she doesn't know she's being controlled all the way to the end, but right. they have her under control, and it's just sim the symbolism. And there's something else. And if you see even the door frames or squares, it's incredible. Like it's the, like if you are in the know, you're probably like, oh. Well, there, there, there was one happens. thing that's really interesting in there that that you almost never pick up one is. It's the scene where um, it's the scene where I, I, I'd have to go back and look at it, but it's very, very latent. It's the scene where he's returning the no, it, it, I can't remember what it is, but you can hear a doorbell ringing and it's it, it's very latent, but it's actually him going down to the satanic cult to tell them something. But you would never hear that doorbell if you weren't listening for it. It's very subtle. Interesting. Yeah. See, there's subtle things in there. Like he like there's when you watch it and no guy is in on it. The whole movie changes because you see him just subtly goading her along or taking this. Some is very obvious, but it's uh, it's really something else. And I mean, the the weird correlation between that and the death of John Lennon and Chapman and oh sure, and some other stuff is just off the charts. And, and also Catcher in the Rye. See, supposedly these kind of books like Wizard of Oz and Catcher in the Rye are. Intel, they operate as Intel kind of programming books. So yeah, like, uh, well, I mean, I mean, that that's always one of the things is are these things like, uh, you know, the the Queen of Diamonds and the Manchurian Candidate, because um, um, what was it? They, the both both Reagan's assassin and 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 Lennon's were both reading Catcher in the Rye. Right, four um, months apart. That's only four months apart. That's incredible. And I think I think Hinckley, one of them, the The Wizard of Oz was their favorite movie. And um, and the gun, I know the gun that Hinckley purchased to kill Reagan was purchased at a pawn shop at Dealey Plaza. Um, that's Get out. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. It's so strange. I think that he had, I think it was Chapman who had some kind of like uh, altar or something that he had set up in his hotel room that had Wizard of Oz. Yeah, iconography or something like it. Yeah, just there is, there is. It was, it was. It's one of the two. I can't remember which one. It was either Hinckley or Chapman that had like Wizard of Oz statues and stuff in his in his apartment or something like that. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Have you heard this? The director for The Exorcist. You cover The Exorcist in your books. Uh, was Jeffrey Dahmer's M.K. Alter handler? Was that Blatty? Big? I don't know. No, well, you Blatty wrote the novel. Um, William Friedkin directed it. Um, there's a lot going on in The Exorcist that's quite unique. 
Um, this movie is also linked um, to the to this curse. I mean, one of the things that's unique in that is one of the characters in the in the movie is the Exorcist steps, of course, um, and and the steps are seventy five steps plus two landings, seventy seven. Um, that that's interesting. Um, but that that is a a very very um, interesting movie because that is probably a mind control psyop. Uh, put out by the CIA because, and this is uh, mainstream reviewers started picking up on this to an extent because the whole the whole purpose of that movie is to squash out to crush the radicalism of the 1960s. You will actually believe it or not, um, if you go back and read reviews from 1973 74 when it was released, you will actually find uh, reviewers talking about this. I mean, they they didn't know the CIA aspect of it, but they were like, oh, this whole movie seems to be you know, to be putting down this radicalism that we just went through in the 60s. And that's what it is. I mean, clearly the Jesuits, the sun priests are, are, are represent the state. The, the, the rowdy demon is, 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 you know, what you'd call, you know, the counterculture and they're there to destroy it. Yeah. They're there to throw it out, get rid of it. Um, and I mean, it's even a, it's a Georgetown, right? And it doesn't take place in Georgetown, Jesuit right, school. Like right. I mean, it, yeah, it's the Jesuit school at Georgetown, the university. I mean, and even, um, uh, what is it? It's when it's when the um, when the Chris McNeil character, which is based on Shirley MacLaine, by the way, uh, that's uh, that's the Ellen Burstein character. When, when she's filming the movie Crash Course, um, she gets up and says, you know, you know, you know, everybody go back to school. You know, you can't do all this if you want to affect change. It has to be within the system. You know, basically shut shut up and go back to class. I mean, again, it's it's the same. It's the same sort of you know yeah. theme of you know crushing out the night, snuffing out the 1960s. Uh, Blatty, the guy who wrote it, was a CIA intel operator. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about Friedkin. Uh, being Jeffrey Dahmer's handler, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. But um, yeah, I mean that that's a very interesting movie. There there's a, a ton of stuff going on, on in that thing. There, there is, is um, a connection between Blatty because Blatty directed the third one, right? And that was Jeffrey like Dahmer's Exorcist favorite three. film. Yeah. What was it? What uh, Legion or whatever it was or the Exorcist? Yeah, it was three? season of the. Uh, oh yeah, it was number three. Was the one that Dahmer used to play the one by Blatty that okay. had George C. Scott in it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the one the he used to play. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that, but yeah, uh, no. yeah. Um, the 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 movie is very neoplatonic. It uses weather to convey the whole thing of good good versus bad guy. Um, the one thing that's unique in there, and I guess this ties into Crowley's gematria, is is and I, I kind of have a mixed 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 emotions about this because at first I thought it was one thing, but maybe now it's something else. Is if you pay attention to it. The, the, the Damien Karras Jesuit character is clearly meant to be a, sort of a Christ figure for the little girl. He's, the, he's her deliverer. He's her savior. When you watch this thing, um, the number 33 repeats all over the place with this thing. Um, you know, I mean, when he's first seen, he, he ascends. He's in, usually in a state of ascension. When you first see him, he's coming up the flight of steps onto the subway platform from uh, 33rd Street. That's a reference to Jesus Christ, obviously. Um, it, what is it? The movie Crash Course, CC33. Um, when Marin arrives at the house at the end, he's in capital cab, CC33. And they're at the party. The song they're singing is down on Toity, Toid, and Toid. That's New York slang for 33rd and 3, or 33rd and 3. So clearly you have this rep repetitive, this endless repetitive of threes going on. My initial reaction to this was this was a Christ reference. But then if you read Crowley, Crowley says, well, 333 is this number of this demon Corazon, which is this very violent, destructive, malicious demon. And you can't help but wonder is, you know, is this some sort of demonic conjuration where it's putting this demon in the celluloid? You know, is that why it's so damn, you know, scary? Um, and, and you'll see this. You'll see this with other directors doing this. Ari Aster does this, um, plays around with this big time. At least I, I think he did with Hereditary and Midsommar. Where in, in Hereditary, the demon is, is Paimon. This is from Ars Goetia, the lesser key. And if, if, if you watch Midsommar, this is the next movie he made. This is the Wizard of Oz movie. Um, the number nine repeats all over the place in this thing. I mean, it, repeat, it is just endlessly being used. And if you look into it, it's, it's a number that is very critical within Norse mythology. So you say to yourself, okay, now I see why he's doing it. But then when you go look at Ars Goetia, the lesser key, oh boy, what do I find? You know, the number nine is the payment demon. That's the, he's the ninth demon in the lesser key. And I, I just can't, I, I, I mean, when I see something like Midsommar and it's so disturbing and just so horrifying, 
I just can't help believe that these movies aren't some sort of conjuration vehicle that allows these demons to manifest in the celluloid. And there's certain movies that just throw off these, you know, horrendous vibes, the exorcist, yeah. you know, Heredity and is uh, really terrifying. Yeah. And, and I just feeling think, sick. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I just think that this is, I don't know whether it's advertent or inadvertent, but these movies just seem to be these vehicles uh, for this, for this evil to spread in and manifest itself. Um, I, I'm convinced of that. I think that's intentional. You know, I think that people have likened these films to magic. Uh, yeah. Kind of anger and all these things. It's like, this is a magical medium, you know? And maybe it's uh, they're very flat films that are very topical, but some aren't. Some are dealing with incredible themes. Like Ninth Gate is, I mean, you want to talk about the number nine. Ninth Gate is about as evil as it gets. Like, yeah. he goes, Johnny Depp goes and works for Corso or, or the guy, and then, oh, Boris Balkin, right? That's a five and a six, so it's an 11. He goes to work for Boris Balkin, Balls and finding the most evil book, and then becomes the guy that Balkin wants to become and usurps him. And at the very end, there's the marriage of yeah. the beast and the whore, right? Yep. Harlot and the beast at the end. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Very, 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 and you know, why am I not surprised that that's Roman Polanski? Yeah. Yeah. You should be. He's mm -hmm. totally involved in the occult. I mean, Tate and all that stuff. And I mean, yeah, uh, the overlap between his films and the in the Manson event, I think, uh, would be very interesting. Yeah, it, it's I don't interesting. Think anybody's done it. Well, it's interesting because the Charles Manson's full name is Charles Miles Manson. Uh, if you put that into Dramatria, you're going to get a value of seventy-seven. And um, the White Album, which inspired him, is ninety-three minutes long, which is, of course, Crowley's wow. magic number. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, there's a lot there. Before I forget, too, Crowley Mench is tied into the Jack the Ripper by a girl. I forgot her name, but she wrote a book called Tiger Woman. And if you look that up, she talks. She was at the Abbey of Thelema with Crowley, and he brought out all these ties that he said were the you know belonged to Jack the Ripper. That's what he said. So no, it's kind that's of interesting. It's a weird. That's an interest. I'll send you the link. I have it somewhere. Tiger yeah, please Ripper. email it to me. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I'll send it out to you. We are at the 50 minute mark, Robert. Is there anything you'd like to add? Anything I missed? Or, I mean, you have so much information. You've got three books. It's a really good deal. I bought you three books for $20 on Amazon with just some of the stuff I'd never covered. You know, I've never seen. So, no, we can, um, yeah, no, well, we can wrap it up here. I mean, it's been just about an hour. Um, and again, I would just say, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a broad topic. I mean, you know, like you're like me. I mean, you're, you have the same interest that I do. I and mean, we could probably spend the next five hours, uh, yeah, talking yeah, about this stuff yeah, with the yeah, numbers definitely. and the demons and, this, that, and the other. Um, but I would say thank you for having me on your show tonight. It was my pleasure to be here. Um, if you're interested with what I've been talking about and you're interested in my books, the easiest place to find me uh, is my website. Uh, my website is my name. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV, and it's just that all connected lowercase. It's Robert W. Sullivan. And then for the fourth, it's the letter I, the letter V, Roman numeral, Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com. Uh, there are links there to purchase the books. Um, when I do interviews such as this, I post them there. This will go up probably tonight. Um, there's information about me. There's contact information. Uh, if you want to have me on your show or, you know, even if you have a fair question to ask, I, I certainly do my best to answer them. Um, and again, there's information about me, shows I'm going to do, links to buy the books. All my books are on all the main all online retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. You can get the paperback editions or the or the ebooks, the Kindles, what have you. Um, and again, thank you, thank you, Bill, for having me on your show tonight. We'll do it again, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm um, sure we will. Yeah, Great talk. No there's a lot. That. I feel like we covered 10% that's in the, those three books. We can do a whole other show on uh, Twin Peaks, which just popped back huh. up. The numerology of Twin Peaks popped up on my... Uh, Social media yesterday, right? Because of the the numerology. Did, did you see that? What was the Just numerology? But I know, was, I know, I know. Lynch Lynch is obsessed with the Wizard of Oz. I mean, he's another one. There was something he said at Twin Peaks of a date and time. So Kyle McLaughlin went out and drove to the site at the same time and repeated that line. I forgot what it was. Somebody in the chat probably knows. Well, but it just, was like. I don't know much about Twin Peaks. So I, 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 I analyzed it in, in the third movie book because that, that's a, that's heavy hitting because, I mean, you, anytime you're doing a TV show, it's it's that 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 show is incredibly alchemical. I mean, you have references to Crowley, the Black Brotherhood, the Black and White Lodges that comes out of Crowley, that comes out of Blavatsky. Um, but but Lynch is obsessed with with the Wizard of Oz. I mean, he, he just about references it as much as he can. Um, what, you know, I mean, for example, I mean, in the movie with, uh, Nick Cage, Laura Dern, Wild at Heart, I mean, the, the mom comes the wicked witch, 
Um, I mean, there's there's a reference to it in, um, uh, oh God, just about every, all, all his movies. There's some little Wizard of Oz homage. The one that I liked that he did um, that really eluded me for a while was the one with... Um, uh, the one that came out in the mid nineties with Robert Blake, where Robert Blake plays kind of like the personification of evil. Which one is that? Um, um, oh God, it's escaping me now. Um, uh. What he says, McLaughlin says, Diane, 11 30 AM, February 24th, entering the town of twin peaks. So he McLaughlin repeated that. What is it? 20, 33 years later or something like that. Yeah. So okay. It's Kyle McLaughlin driving past the Twin Peaks sign at 11:30 a.m. February 24th, 2024. It's I'll it's also it, it's in Mulholland Drive at the 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 fast food restaurant at the beginning is Winkies. That's the guards that guard the Wicked Witch or the Winkies. Um, and then what's the movie that he made in the mid 90s with Robert Blake, where he plays the devil oh, essentially? All right. Yeah. And the, with the white that. face. Um, Lost Highway. Lost Highway. Lost yeah. Highway. That's Richard Pryor's last movie. He's only in it for about five minutes. Well, what's Richard? I, what's Richard Pryor? Richard Pryor's The Wizard of Oz. Richard Pryor played The Wizard of Oz in The Wiz. Um, so there's your little wow. Wizard of Oz link uh, in in wow. in Lost Highway. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, those are re really crazy connections. And there's a lot of them. I mean, oh, there's sure. a lot of stuff people have been uh, seen but don't understand. And that's the importance of books like yours. So thank you so much for your time, Robert. Really appreciate it. I'll put oh, a link to your website in the show notes. Thank yeah, you no, so much. Thank you, William, for having me on. It's my pleasure. And again, we'll do this again sometime. I have no yeah, doubt. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Stay there. Stay there. Okay.